Hey everyone, um, let's do a quick uh, introduction real fast. Um, Mike, you want to kick off with an intro? Yeah, um, real quick, we're here to talk um, about uh, taking some cloud native capabilities um, that exist in uh, CamelK and exploiting them for some cloud native goodness. Um, as a result, the topic is um, uh, cloud native my camel. Um, we're going to get into all of that here in a second, right? Um, real quick, uh, I'm a guy who's been around in the industry for 20 something years. I've been at Red Hat for um, about seven. Um, I've been primarily in the uh, integration space over the last um, uh, longer than I'd like to admit to in uh, my career. And um, uh, as mentioned, I work at Red Hat. I'm, uh, I work for an integration uh, pra practice um, that we have there. Um, and I'm a senior architect there. And um, likewise for me, I'm in the, the integration practice at Red Hat. Um, I've been spending the past um, three, four years in a lot in a Kubernetes context. So um, if I'm if I'm in a file, it's uh, it's likely a YAML file. <laughs> um, but I do work with a, a lot of organizations on on adopting Camel, um, kind of teaching uh, the Camel DSL and using Camel as a teaching tool. Um, so writing a lot of Camel too. Um, and I think you'll you'll see a little later these days you can write Camel in YAML. Um, so I'm doing that. Um, uh, also, um, as I mentioned, work on the on the on the same team um, with uh, with Michael at Red Hat. Um, so we're we focus on on sort of the integration uh, stack, um, and that's what we'll we'll be talking about today. Um, so just a quick overview of the agenda. Um, we're going to um, talk about uh, how how we kind of came to Camel, a little bit of uh, uh, history, and, and you know how how did we get to where we are now. Um, then start talking about what that might look like in the cloud. Um, and we have um, we have sort of a, a proposal um, around how how you might do that and how we might come up with a cloud native architecture um, based around Camel. Um, and then we have a, a demo of uh, of that exact thing um, that that Mike will run through towards the end. That's that's what we're after here, and we'll um, go ahead and and launch into it. Um, so how we came to EIPs and Camel, um, and I, I I mean we literally because I I, I think um, you know probably a lot of a lot of you on the phone are in the same place and. Mike and I um, have been kind of on this journey with uh, with Camel as well, right? Um, this was all kind of starting when I was in college. Um, Mike was maybe a fair bit into his uh, into his career because he's a lot older than me. <laughs> um, but anyway, so how how did we get here? Um, you know, in the early days, we we started um, moving uh, from from one giant mainframe to a little bit of client client server, right? And there was a lot of need for remote invocation. Um, there are all kinds of tools, uh, you know, being being built around this stuff. Um, and a lot of them were accomplishing sort of the, the same goals, but they they um, sort of modeled some of our integration patterns that we borrowed from the mainframe systems. Um, a, a few really, really smart people got together um, and, and decided to kind of Document a new class of patterns, right? There, there were you know a lot of object-oriented patterns, um, kind of in, in those days that were pretty well understood, um, but but not necessarily patterns that describe how we integrate systems, um, specifically um, you know involving stuff like asynchronous messaging and um, that kind of thing. So, um, so the integration uh, patterns book book was written, and that really helped us. Um, Establish a, a common vocabulary um, and and kind of distill our, our techniques down to generic patterns. Um, so that really inspired um, Camel, um, and, and uh, a, essentially a DSL was was built around around the idea of these generic patterns. Um, if you look on the right, you can 
you're probably all pretty familiar with camel but um but just in case you know you see like just an example of a pattern um and how easy uh, that is to kind of describe with with dsl so that's how we got the camel um, yikes went too far um so um the the context that we were uh it, at least when 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 camel was was kind of first um, coming onto the scene. The context that we were using um, a lot um, was was SOA. That was sort of the um, the architectural pattern that um, had the most mind share. Um, and we tend to talk about SOA like it's a kind of a thing of the past sometimes uh, these days. Um, and it's it's really not right. It's really everywhere, and it still um, helps um, make the world go round. Um, so, so and, and we and we continue to use um, some of the core uh, core concepts that we learned in, in SOA, right? Um, exposing service endpoints over common communication standards is is still pretty much the name of the game. Um, we we learned about how uh, loose coupling techniques, right, um, and and the impact that that can have on on organizations. We still very much lean on those concepts. Um, the, the in, in particular, the enterprise service bus um, pattern really started to uh, emerge, um, enabled us to kind of pull legacy services that don't necessarily conform to our common communication standards natively, um, pull them into, um, into our overall um, enterprise systems. Um, and, and in general, ESB, ESBs kind of gave us a platform for um, in implementing complex processes, orchestrating services, that kind of thing. Um, there were challenges uh, for sure, and still continue to be challenges um, uh, with the enterprise service bus pattern and, and SOA in general. Um, there's a lot. There's uh, we we rely pretty crit critically on on state management in an ESB, um, and largely that you know. Uh, that that might revolve around a, a message broker in the middle of that, right? Um, but uh, you know, whenever we're dealing with state, you know, we have some pr pretty familiar trade-offs between consistency and availability, right? Um, that that hasn't gone away. We don't have a, an easy solution for for that still today. Um, a lot of ESBs, uh, you know, were sort of almost, uh, you know. Uh, very platform specific in, in in terms of the interfaces that they presented, right? Um, uh, so you know we we might get kind of a little bit locked or stuck in in a vendor's implementation. Um, that's the you know that's still a lingering problem that um, that a lot of organizations need to manage. Um, and then, you know, in, in general, from a philosophical perspective, you know, ESBs um, started to Kind of take on this like central management model for the enterprise, right? And that so it, it, these days, especially with the, you know the new philosophies of, of of microservices kind of coming into the picture, some some organizations view that as sort of a bottleneck or or kind of a, a philosophical clash um, with you know small distributed teams. Um, so. Um, <clears throat> You know, in, in general, and hopefully this looks like you know pretty familiar to to everyone. Um, we've kind of been on this on this evolutionary path from you know point to point connections to sort of enterprise service bus, and and now you know we're starting to play with even breaking down individual applications into small um, components um, and 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 incorporating a, a microservices architecture into our into our enterprise designs. So um, while we haven't really like ironed out all of the all of the problems and issues that that we've dealt with with SOA and and ESB, um, uh, a, a new sort of um, a, a new sort of um, driving factor has kind of come onto the scene. Many organizations um, have either. Uh, uh, an ambition or or maybe even a mandate to adopt um, cloud infrastructure right um, and it brings a new set of concerns um, to the the set of concerns that we already had right um, 
we need to, uh, the main thing is that we need to expect infrastructure to fail, you know, sometimes and tolerate it, right? That's, that's the, the main thing we have to watch out for in a cloud setting. Um, we still have some concerns about, you know, getting kind of locked into a cloud, um, you know, uh, adopting very specific um, features or, or, or functions of, of uh, you know, cloud offering from a vendor. Um, we, we really want to be careful with cost and, and a lot of time we have the ability to, um, to be careful with cost and we can, we can actually scale down infrastructure and, um, and, and save on costs, but we, we also have to have application components that, um, that are smart enough to do that. Um, so it really doesn't matter if we can scale down the infrastructure, if we can't scale down our, our application layer. Um, and then, you know, of course, to, uh, distributing our architecture across um, infrastructure availability zones is important because again, we sometimes need to expect, well, we need to expect infrastructure to sometimes fail in a cloud setting. Um, so uh, along with, with these concerns, you know, some, some of the tendencies um, of, of organizations these days that are adopting cloud um, is, is to decompose, right? Um, and and potentially adopt a con container platform. So we're seeing a lot of organizations kind of using a container platform to be their, um, their kind of tr cloud translator, right? So that they can be cloud neutral um, and, and deal with a single interface um, that, that uh, can interact with all the, uh, all the various cloud APIs. Um, and of course, microservices, um, you know, is, is an, a more and more popular architectural style um, containers probably influences us to think of, of breaking things down into, into smaller pieces. Um, it tends to fit pretty well into, in, into a container um, platform uh, to kind of have a more distributed um, decomposed system. So that all is, is kind of gaining momentum and popularity, right? Um, but, you know, all of, all of these new concerns and, and techniques um, they, they bring, you know, their own pain points, right? Um, so when we have so many different pieces uh, that we're managing um, and they can, they can spin up and spin down um, in, in our container platform, um, we, we need to keep track of them. Um, and we have some, some new techniques that are involved in terms of instrumenting and, and observing um, the you know component metrics and and health and, and that those kinds of things of our of our components right um, so that's a new challenge um, the the adoption journey of of Kubernetes or container platform um, for developers isn't isn't something uh, that's trivial always right um, sometimes it, it takes some time to ramp up um, and we see we see lots of organizations that that um, need to kind of take maybe a year or two to kind of like re really understand um, container platforms and, and cloud, right? Um, decomposing, uh, you know, we, when, we, when we say we're gonna decompose um, into, into microservices, saying it is one thing, doing it is another, um, it's a huge effort usually. Um, it can take, you know, years to break a, a big monolith down into pieces. Um, so that's also not trivial. Um, and then, you know, there's this lingering thing about state, right? Um, managing state, really, we don't, we, like I said before, we really don't have any easy answers for that. And doing that in, in a cloud context or doing that in a container context um, doesn't help us too much. So, so we still have that concern. And, and like I said, the, the trade-offs between, um, you know, availability and, and consistency. So, um, so that's, that's where we are, um, move, moving to the cloud. Um, and there, there starts to become, um, this, this notion of, of cloud native, um, that, that's kind of, uh, cropping up in conversations now. And, um, and Michael will kind of talk about, um, what what cloud native really means? All right, gang. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Ev. So um, 
we got this edict to go to the cloud, right? And um, we have these integration appliances from the past. We had um, our SOA appliances like the ESB. Um, we started decomposing down into microservice architectures, but we got to the cloud and all of a sudden that was supposed to change everything, right? Um, jazz hands, you're in the cloud. Well, this term started to emerge, right? As we moved into the cloud called cloud native and um, I think it's fair to say it is loosely defined around um, the industry. Um, uh, we'll make sure that everybody gets this deck, but um, you guys will notice there's a GitHub URL there. Uh, in a repo, we have laboriously gone through um, uh, various um, definitions from many different uh, vendors, um, uh, Red Hat, IBM, VMware, what have you. And um, we've kind of come up with some things that really absolutely have to be there. So um, we have a current set of characteristics that we believe distill what cloud native means and ultimately why it's really important to take our integration frameworks that we have right now and put them into this context. So initially we would say we need to be elastic, right? Um, but what we mean by that isn't necessarily that we can provision um, uh, new things all the time, but rather that we should be able to move up and down um, somewhat algorithmically and in response to um, how things are actually um, evolving in our enterprise or the conversations that are happening there. We need to be scalable on demand, right? This can't be, oh yeah, um, on uh, Black Friday, we're gonna need 50 more um, e-commerce servers, right? We need to actually be able to handle spikes in a meaningful way. We need to be resilient. And what we mean by resilient isn't necessarily just, oh, I use a container platform and that has a replication controller and another pod comes up, yay, I'm resilient. What we really mean by that is we need capabilities that allow us to be resilient over the loss of um, availability zones, potentially regions, right? Um, or in a hybrid cloud context uh, where we're even um, reliable over a loss of, let's say, data centers. We have to be highly observable and manageable and that's one thing that the uh, Camel K stack we're going to look at in a second really brings to the table. What's absolutely critical is that we're location agnostic. If you guys will remember that in the bad old days, I like to think of them fondly, when our kind of first client server stuff started to emerge and we started ended, ending up with wire protocols like uh, Corba and different ways to exchange things over the wire, um, any time we had a new one of those, it was absolutely painful. We had to go through all kinds of change controls, so on and so forth. So we need some means of being of not being tied to place, right? Um, we also want to be API centric. Remember, the means through which we provision in the cloud is an API itself, right? We want to define these things and these contracts that happen over the wire uh, and further exploit and extend the promise that our cloud APIs give us. And inevitably, we need to be event driven. Remember, things are coming and going, right, in the cloud. We may and not have the same notions of um, uh, w we can, but we probably don't have the same notions of uh, static things, right? Um, things need to be able to uh, move in the night, show up, go away, so on and so forth. But we also, um, as we kind of decomposed, uh, what is this thing that means the cloud native means and how do I actually do the cloud in a meaningful way? Um, it's more than just a move to the cloud, right? So if I go move to cloud vendor A, um, I'm now bound uniquely to their APIs. Um, a couple of years ago, I'm having a conversation. Um, a particular large box retailer doesn't want to be in one of the clouds. They see it as giving money to the enemy, so to speak, right? Well, they have um, the group. Of uh, the group I was working with had an edict to um, just go move over to some other cloud. They had a pretty painful conversation, saying, "Hey." I, that's gonna take like nine months. What we need is uh, abstractions from proprietary cloud APIs um, via Kubernetes. And more specifically, what we need is an extension of um, the things that Kubernetes gives us um, that allows us to state, um, uh, to extend these ideas and get back to the promise of those cloud native characteristics we see on the left-hand side. Next slide, please. 
And so ultimately, as we have been going through this evolution of how our um, business components and how our enterprises, um, as well as just the services we put together, talk to each other, we've kind of come to another, pl uh, another paradigm shift, if you will. And what a really kind of calls out um, is an ex uh, calls out to us as an effective means to get to the cloud native characteristics that we were talking about in the last slide is the notion of ser serverless, right? We want to extend out these kinds of concepts that we got from SOA, where everything should live on an island and everything should be loosely coupled. That we um, the the evolution of that with microservices, where we wanted independent pipelines for everything, and again we have single responsibility pri uh, promises. We need to go even further into a world where we can do this via semantic resources, via the operator and custom resources we talked about in the last slide. We can scale up and down to zero algorithmically. And at the end of the day, what we really, really need to be able to do is ship code that isn't completely bound to notions of high availability, right? We shouldn't find ourselves um, or, or other things like that, right? So next slide, please. So what we're here to actually talk about today, and we've got a cool little demo that we'll knock off here in a second, or we'll kick off here in a second, is Camel Cat. And um, if we look at the cloud native characteristics that we were after, right? Um, I need to be event driven. I need to be API centric. I need um, capabilities of scaling up and down on demand, right? Um, Camel K gives us uh, all of this. What Camel K is is it takes Kubernetes, it takes Camel, which we've had in ESBs in the past, and then we evolved into other appliances and inevitably into microservices, right? We can take that same Camel DSL and we can do all, have all kinds of cloud native fun with Kubernetes. Um, it has a Kubernetes operator that does the caring and feeding for deployments that we're after. It um, integrates with um, uh, serverless stuff, right? So we can kind of scale up and scale down. Um, specifically, it integrates with Knative um, and Knative uh, serving and eventing stuff. Um, we're also able to use things like Quarkus, right? So we can get really, really, really fast deployment times. It would be absolute, there's so much stuff underneath the Camel K umbrella that it would be impossible for us to talk to you about all of it in any meaningful way. Um, today. However, if we look over to the right hand of the screen, we can see just how easy it is as a developer to actually get this going. Bang, I can, with a simple camel, uh, with a simple CLI command, I can take like a uh, camel that I had, um, just, you know, the camel that I've always used, right? And et voila, I'm off to the cloud. Next slide, please. So that's what, like I said, loosely what camel K is. There's so much there. I can't tell you how much we think you guys should uh, go immediately there. One of the things, uh, so um, let's pr uh, prime, the, uh, prime the pump for the demo real quick. So um, what we've actually are going to share with you guys is a very, very large demo. It takes about an hour and a half. There's just no way we can get there in, um, in a format this small. However, we are going to uh, direct you guys there, and we're going to do a little piece of it. So if you guys will see on the left outside of the little dotted box, there's all kinds of stuff, um, mostly other Apache things, Cupid Dispatch Router. Um, some camel stuff, you guys probably noticed the Kafka icon. Inside of the um, little box is what we're going to be looking at. And I know when we think about serverless, we kind of think, oh, I, I make an HTTP call and something pops up and that's great. But with Knative eventing, and this is what's great about Camel K, I can hook into something called Knative eventing and I get pub sub um, uh, behavior. What we're describing here is your kind of typical subscription channel trigger broker based pub sub um, type thing. And we're actually able to go create using uh, all this good stuff from Camel K that we just talked about on the last slide. We're actually able to create that and then et voila, like scale to zero and have um, our integrations participate over a bus. There's one more thing that's super cool that needs to be talked about here, right? We're not bound like we would have been in the past of a platform specific or um, even vendor specific buses, right? Um, in our case, we have this notion of the Knative eventing broker trigger subscription, right? Which we'll talk about in a second. This allows us to sit anything we want from a persistence perspective behind it. So we could have, it could be just in memory. In our case, we're gonna use a super cool project called Streamzy, and we're gonna actually have it be Kafka. 
right? So things that are participating on our bus are actually persistent and we'll, uh, we'll uh, make sure there's nothing up our sleeves and go actually check out Kafka as part of our demo. Next slide, please. All right. So um, I'm going to give everybody um, a very short period of time uh, to write down this uh, GitHub URL. But um, this is the a large, uh, larger demo. And David, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and share now. And guys, I'm having to share my whole screen, so I apologize, this isn't that awesome. But um, uh, hopefully you guys can see my screen and hopefully you guys can see um, a, uh, an OpenShift console. Um, uh, I'm pointing this out as um, we're using um, uh, OpenShift here, but you don't need to use OpenShift. You could really use any modern Kubernetes distro, right? Um, here we'll see um, the camel K operator. Of course, um, at Red Hat we have uh, um, we've kind of rewrapped that for enterprise customers. But this is all community stuff, and everything you're going to see here is coming from either an Apache project or a CNCF project. Everything lives in the community, and again, there's no reason why you would have to use it, even though our instructions are using the um, uh, origin client or uh, OC command. Um, there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't just do this with kube cuddle or and like I said any um, uh, Kubernetes distro. Real quick, this is the demo. Um, uh, it's uh, very long and circuitous. It's going to take a while. Um, but um, let's go ahead and skip most of the demo and talk about what we're actually going to do here. So. Um, uh, like I said, we're instead of leveraging um, uh, serverless to just pop up something that we can communicate via HTTP to, we actually have a pub sub abstraction that we've gotten via Knative eventing. And some of the core kind of components here, and uh, from a theory perspective at a high level, what's going on is we have notions of brokers, triggers, subscribers, so on and so forth. To decompose this a little bit further, um, we use what are called channels, right? Um, uh, that we have inevitable subscriptions to. What will happen is once we start flowing things on a channel, and this all happens over HTTP, and what's great is we have a normalized message payload. It's called the cloud event spec. So once we start flowing these things over, we'll notice um, uh, um, we'll notice that uh, um, pods start popping up and um, potentially going away if they're not needed. So real quick, let's hop over um, to um, uh, the actual demo and start running some stuff. Um, as we saw previously, we're in um, uh, we're in um, uh, OpenShift here, right? And um, I'm just using the OC command. Real quick, we've got a namespace that's called Knative Eventing. Um, there's a lot of stuff here, but it, what is worth noting is we have um, uh, we have some stuff that's providing um, a web hooks, uh, channel dispatchers, so on and so forth. If we go over to um, where I have some stuff uh, stored, um, you'll see what we have in um, a namespace called Cloud One is a something that we're calling a broker. Right. Um, this is actually, if we do, um, uh, uh, if we do um, a little, uh, if we check out a description of this real quick, what we'll notice is, ah, yes, um, there's the spec. Um, we actually have a config map that is uh, based on Kafka uh, that uh, wires us up for Kafka channels. I can dive deep into that. To be honest, I could spend the rest of the day talking to you guys about this, but just trust me, we have this notion of a broker and. We, that is wired up to use something called Kafka channels. We also have um, we also have uh, um, these uh, notions of channels, which we saw from the uh, schematic. We have two channels here, and if we take a quick peek at what they actually are. And I, uh, I type stuff right. Oops. All right. What these actual are are our Kafka channels, and we have um, uh, three partitions. Just like we we have partitions, we have a replication factor for our um, uh, for our channel. We'll take a peek here real quick and see our Kafka channels. Um, all 
Right, and we'll notice a few different uh, things. We have um, the trigger that we saw previously and those two channels. If we go over to, um, oh yes. So um, just uh, so we know that there's nothing up my sleeve, let's go over here um, to a project where I have um, uh, some uh, Kafka brokers. In fact, I have one Kafka broker running. So real quick, I'm going to uh, exec in. And just so you guys again know there's nothing up my sleeve, bang, I'm in this small event cluster. Let's CD into the bin directory. And again, all the usual stuff we're used to seeing with Kafka, which is another um, uh, uh, Apache project, by the way. And let's... Um, I think this is the right incantation, but I did give myself a cheat sheet. So, okay, cool. And so you guys will notice that we actually have um, uh, Kafka topics that represent the exact same um, uh, set of Kafka channels that we just had this Knative eventing abstraction for. So real quick, you're probably like, uh, okay, Mike, but what about Camel K? Because you just described everything but Camel K. So one of the ways, um, uh, so, we describe um, our uh, um, we describe our integrations and our camel stuff as it lives in this world. Um, we describe it with um, uh, something called an integration. And if we look at this piece of YAML, we'll see a few things that are near and dear to our heart. So um, we've got some status stuff we won't worry about here. But um, if you guys look uh, real quick, what you'll notice is we actually have like an entire um, camel DSL here uh, stored in content. We also have a few different things such as um, whether or not uh, uh, the traits um, that this particular camel integration will have. It doesn't have to necessarily integrate with Knative. It could have a Quarkus trait as well. It could have um, a deployment trait that says, hey, just deploy me as a regular old pod. I don't really care about Knative. But with Knative, we get some uh, we um, get some goodness, right? So um, sweet. So let's go to the heart of the matter, which is um, which is the actual camel. Let me go here real quick because I want to describe something that's actually super cool. In Camel three, as you guys know, we're um, uh, I believe at a, a dot one or potentially even higher uh, GA distro of Camel. Um, what we'll notice is we have a new set of uh, components. One of the great Camel components we have is the Knative component, and this is the integration that we saw up there. It's literally this simple, um, uh, and we're going to see some cool stuff here, but I participate on the bus, that abstraction that I was just talking about, um, via use of the Knative component. I'm able to pick up messages off the bus, and I'm also able to persist messages off the bus. This code doesn't do anything very simple or very uh, complex. It just, sets, um, uh, it just uh, sets a body and continues on about its way. It does a little bit of logging, right? Um, and so uh, if um, let's go take another uh, look at something and let's actually do it. So um, well, that thing won't, uh, it consumes off the bus, right? And produces to the bus. So we need something to actually send it some messages, right? Um, here we have uh, something which we're actually going to go throw up there right now using the camel uh, with a K C L I. And what our demo does, if you guys go actually do it, it does a bunch of cool stuff with AMQP. However, in our case, we just want to chirp some events, right? And we want to chirp them into a Knative channel, right? So bang, we'll go ahead and just use a timer real quick. So let's go back over to our command. Uh, let's go back over to the shell. Um, just so I don't waste your guys' time, uh, um, I have myself a little cheat sheet. So we'll go um, post uh, in there. All right, and it says um, the AMQP sync uh, was created. If we look at um, what's actually happening right now in um, uh, in um, our uh, Kubernetes namespace, we actually just created an integration. It was literally that simple, and bang, everything's going. We started chirping messages, and oh wow, there's our scale to zero integration, right? Um, all ready to go, doing its thing. Let's actually see what's going on there. And, and just for clarification, um, the 
the event bus transformation um, that you just saw kind of uh, wake up um, here um, where that Mike is showing you, that was deployed um, prior and, and scaled, scaled to zero, but still subscribed to an event channel. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, so remember, we just had a timer that was like chirping events, right? So let's go ahead and um, uh, delete the um, integration that we just created, right? Um, and we're going to see something uh, kind of cool. All right. So um, we notice um, uh, that thing is terminating, right? Um, uh, we probably will notice. Um, We're kind of stopping uh, consuming messages. There's no more messages for us to get off the bus, right? Um, in our integration that just scaled up from uh, zero, right? If we um, go take a peek at our uh, integrations, we um, we're still scaled to um, one with this particular um, uh, with this particular integration. Um, so what Knative does is it actually says to, um, uh, it uh, samples um, either of two things. It samples in-flight um, dispatches to your particular Knative service, or um, what it does is it says, hey, you've got some other mess, uh, you've got some other thing, right? Um, let's say uh, CPU um, or something like that via something called an HPA scaler, and that will actually um, uh, uh, determine whether or not we need to scale out or scale down. What we've just seen here is that we um, are scaling down. If um, I think that pod's probably gone. All right, it's almost gone. And um, if we take a peek back at the integrations, we'll notice that the event bus transformation integration has been scaled to zero. And because um, I, uh, you guys probably uh, want to make sure that I have nothing up my sleeves. Let's go back to Kafka, right? And um, uh, let's um, go ahead and make sure stuff actually got there. And I'm not just making this all up. <laughs> all right. So again, um, here I am back in Kafka. All right. Um, let me go back to my cheat sheet. Sorry about that, gang. And Uh, let's go ahead and copy that command, and I'm just going to do a simple Kafka. Cons Oops, that's not going to work. Just going to do a simple Kafka consumer to make sure that I got some messages. Uh, did I really do that? Awful. And if I had the right syntax, I would be doing that. But um, give me two seconds to fix that. All right, and um, you can see uh, we actually those messages, uh, the logging that we just saw is um, showing up here in this actual topic. So we had persistent of the persistence of our messages as it flowed over the bus. Um, I think we're kind of up on time. Um, so, um, gang, that is um, uh, that's the demo. Um, David, would you mind uh, sharing again? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so anyways, uh, gang, um, uh, you may have some questions. We moved through some things very, very quickly. I wouldn't um, uh, please go to the full on demo because we show you absolutely everything that's going on there. But we also um, go talk about a bunch of other cool things that you can use along with CamelK. We have some really, really good cloud native integration goodness. Well, that was really awesome. You know, you went through it at space and you covered a lot of ground there. So I don't actually see any questions, but if anyone has them, we have like a minute uh, to get to those. Uh, be sure to check the link that was uh, provided. So I actually pasted the wrong one. I pasted the cloud native integration repository and I see cloud native event mesh, but you can find that the same GitHub organization, both of these. Uh, demos, and I guess both of them are worth checking out. Yeah, the uh, um, the the cloud native repository is is a little bit more of us exploring um, the definition of cloud native. Not not really any code in there, um, 
So if you're interested in our thought process and kind of how we got to the characteristics of, of cloud native, that, that's a good place to look. But the actual demo is in the link that you see right there on the screen. All right, awesome. And the slides will be shared so you'll get to all the links and the meet and greets of, of the stuff. So uh, the next topic is already starting and it's Andre. Um, so head back to the sessions and find that session there. Thank you very much, David and Michael. Thanks, guys. Appreciate uh, having a chance to share with everyone. Yeah. See you guys in the community. Have a great conference.